Second thing I think that we learn about the consequences of sin from these chapters is God shows us how sin separates man from him. That sin separates man from God. It is, of course, especially in the case of Adam and Eve themselves, I think that we see this. We know what happens, that after Adam and Eve sin, God confronts them uh, in the Garden of Eden. And he says, you know, what happened? We know how uh, Adam points the finger at his wife, and his wife points the finger at uh, the serpent. But then we are told, at the summation of the whole thing, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 23, after Satan has been cursed and the woman has been told she is going to have pain in childbirth and man is told that the ground is cursed because of him. After all of these things have happened, verse 23, it says, Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim. And the flaming sword which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. To appreciate the significance of this, I think we have to realize something that I'm not going to try and develop in any length tonight. I'm, I'm just going to assert it and offer a few hints. Uh, I'm sure, in fact, I've mentioned this in other contexts uh, here previously. I, I believe we have to understand the Garden of Eden was kind of like heaven on earth. It was, a, if you will, a miniature version of heaven. When you say, what's the basis of saying that? Well, first of all, you think there was no sin there when God made it. Uh, there was no sin there, and God and man were in perfect fellowship with one another there in the Garden of Eden. But not only that, when we finally get to the end of the Bible, and we see the end of the story in heaven itself, you remember how heaven is described in the book of Revelation? As a return to the Garden of Eden. And I think there are a lot of other things that connect with that throughout uh, the Bible. I think that uh, the temple in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament likewise are presented to us as, you might say, miniature versions of heaven on earth. But the first one, the first heaven on earth, the first place where God and man dwell together in fellowship was the Garden of Eden. And so when God sends man out of the Garden of Eden, it's not just a matter of, well, man had a nice place to live and God said, you know, what can I do to punish him? I can take away his nice home. God was actually removing man from the tree of life, from the tree of life and the life that God provides when man lives in fellowship with him. And until the process, the story of redemption is finished, until heaven itself, man doesn't get to return to the tree of life. And so I suggest that the second thing that we learn is that sin separates man from his God. And from here on, the whole story of the Bible is how sin can be overcome. God's plan to bring redemption from sin so that man can be reunited with God and find the tree of life once again in heaven itself. A third thing I would suggest that we learn about the consequences of sin from these chapters, a third thing is that sin separates, not only separates man from God, it also separates man from his fellow man. The Bible really doesn't say anything about the first thing I'm going to mention here. It just, of course, tells us that Adam and Eve, after God had confronted them and announced the curse as a result of sin, including the woman's pain, including her uh, submission to her husband, uh, including man's work in the fields, that's all it tells us, really. They were driven out. But, you know, I, I have to wonder how all of this transformed the relationship between Adam and Eve. They had a lot of years left to live together. She had a lot of pain to go through in childbirth. He had a lot of weeds and thistles to hoe over those next years. And I wonder how many times she thought about the consequences of their sin. I wonder how many times he was out there hoeing and found himself tempted to blame her once again. I wonder about all of that. I wonder if, if they maybe looked back to the relationship that they had had in the Garden of Eden prior to sin coming along and thought about how much happier they had been at that time and realized perhaps even in their own lives the way in which sin had come between them. 
But if we might just wonder about Adam and Eve, there's no doubt about the next generation, about sin separating man from his fellow man. Adam and Eve would in fact live to see perhaps the most painful thing that parents could see, and that is to see their brothers at enmity, their children at enmity with one another so that one brother kills another. In Genesis chapter 4, we read the dreadful account of Cain and Abel. You know, I think all of us probably over the last few days have really been struck. It's just almost impossible not to be touched uh, by the events up there in South Carolina where apparently, I realize there hasn't been a trial and all of that yet, but uh, apparently a woman has confessed to uh, murdering her own two children. I mean, we just... We, we say that that's almost unfathomable, and certainly it is. I would say that that's another good picture for us of ultimately the consequences of sin. I want to suggest that, that I think probably that same type of horror, that same type of revulsion is what we ought to feel. And I think probably what Adam and Eve, the mother and father, no doubt felt when they realized what had happened between their two children, their oldest sons, Cain and Abel, and that Cain had murdered Abel simply because he was jealous of apparently what uh, God's acceptance of Abel's sacrifice and his rejection of his. And not only that, when God confronts Cain and says, why are you angry in chapter 4 and verse 6, uh, and in verse 9 when he says, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know, am I my brother's keeper? You see, sin not only led to the ultimate act of murder, sin led Cain to feel like his brother wasn't his responsibility. That enmity, that hatred, that carelessness even of man for his fellow man, even brother for his brother. And ultimately, you know, we say, well, these are really brothers. You know, the fact of the matter is we're all brothers in Adam, aren't we? And uh, yet... Brothers in Adam still kill each other. Adam's children are still murdering each other. The consequences of sin, it separates man from his fellow man. Not only does sin separate man from his fellow man, but I would suggest further that sin separates man from his environment, from the natural world. Environmentalism now is one of the cause celebs of our particular generation, and uh, it's always noble to, uh, to, you know, defend the environment. The truth of the matter is that as this world was created, man was not an enemy to his environment or his environment to him. But because of sin, well, look in Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 17, as God confronts Adam. He says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. So that now what had once been uh, a world around him that, you might say, responded to his every need. It seems like the Garden of Eden was one of those places where you just touch things and they grow. Uh, you know, we've all looked at people, said they've got a green thumb. Well, apparently, Adam had a, a green garden, <laughs> so to speak, that it was uh, the very nature of it, apart from sin, was such that it met his every need. And it was a protection for him. It was a home for him. But now he's going to be removed from that. And he's going to find that the world turns against him. We're not told anything about the animals, uh, but uh, I have often supposed, in part on the basis of later passages in the prophets in the Old Testament, that probably it was only as a result of sin that the animals became hostile to man, uh, that they likewise began to threaten him. Why do I say that? Well, because later on in the prophets, they talk about the day that will come when the lion shall lie down with the lamb or, or the wolf with the lamb. I always forget who's lying down with who. But the picture is that of peace and harmony in the world again. 
And that, that, of course, is the image that those prophets used to point to the day of salvation, to the day when man will finally be delivered from sin. So sin separates man from the world about him so that he doesn't live in peace and tranquility and harmony like God made it. In fact, people often say, why does God allow things like, well, in Florida here, people might point to hurricanes, or in the Midwest, maybe they would point to tornadoes or earthquakes. Why does God allow these uh, tragedies, these disasters to come? Well, I think the answer is that's part of the consequence of sin. God didn't plan things that way to start with. That's what comes upon mankind because of sin. And in fact, when man has become so sinful that God is going to send that first great judgment upon them in Genesis chapter 6, what does he choose to judge man with? He turns man's world against him. He sends the flood uh, upon him. So sin separates man from his environment. 